Good afternoon and welcome to today's panel on navigating high-risk pregnancy, <clears throat> hosted by Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare. And we thank you all for joining us today um, for this year's Baby and Family Fair virtual series and look forward to answering your questions today. I'm Sean Roberts. This is my wife, Courtney Roberts. Um, and together we'll be your moderators today. Uh, this topic is one that's very near and dear to our hearts. And um, Courtney, you want to tell me a little about our story? Sure. Um... So um, Sean and I have had multiple um, experiences with high-risk pregnancies. Um, we initially um, became pregnant in 2009 and um, very quickly into that pregnancy, um, I became very sick. Um, I had a condition known as hyperemesis gravidarum, which is um, just extreme nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. Um, I pretty much was unable to care for myself. Um, I had to resign from my job. Um, just a very quick change um, in life. And so that was difficult. Um, the next few months, we really just took it day by day, um, managing those symptoms the best we could. Um, and then, you know, we were past the 12 week point. We kind of thought things were good. Um, still dealing with a lot of sickness. Um, but we, we moved forward. Um, around um, 18 weeks, um, um, one evening I got up um, to get something from the kitchen and um, I noticed that something didn't feel right. Um, and um, I really felt like I had to go to the bathroom and things were um, just not feeling like they should. Um, we took a trip to triage um, to get a checkup and we I um, soon learned that I was leaking amniotic fluid, um, which was not a, a good thing. Um, but we went home um, and a few days later, we had a follow up with the maternal fetal specialist. Um, and we found out that um, my membranes had fully ruptured and um, there was no amniotic fluid left and that our baby had passed away, um, which we were obviously very distraught and confused. Um, it wasn't how we envisioned um, our, our pregnancy going, um, especially a first one where you're pretty clueless. Um, so the days after that, we um, had to schedule to go into the hospital and, and deliver the baby. And it was a very um, difficult and somewhat traumatic um, time for us. Um, very quickly after that, um, we became pregnant with our second child, um, our son Noah. and. Um, I again developed hyperemesis, so I was still very sick. Um, but that pregnancy was for us filled with a lot of anxiety and fear. Um, fear over, um, you know, is this going to happen again? How far are we going to make it through this pregnancy? Just a lot of anxiety about the unknown um, on top of the sickness. Um, fast forward to the end of the pregnancy. Um, I developed a condition known as preeclampsia. Um, I had extreme high blood pressure. Um, and so we had to go in um, for our son. We had to go in a month early and do an emergency C-section. Um, that, again, was something that we had not anticipated. Um, we were very nervous and scared um, about him being born a month early. Um, at that point, he um, had to go into the NICU. Um, and I was still very sick, so I remained in the hospital as well. Um, again, we, we had a baby. He was here with us, but he was very sick, and I was very sick. So um, once again, we just kind of found ourselves like, why is this happening? You know, this is confusing. This is not how we saw things um, playing out. Um, fast forward, we, you know, bring our baby home. Um, he continues to grow and thrive, and um, we start to discuss, you know, wanting to grow our family. Um, pregnancy, we knew, was very hard on, on my body and our family, um, so we, we started investigating adoption um, and looking into that for growing our family. Um, however, we got a few steps down the road and found out that we were pregnant unexpectedly with our third baby. Um, obviously very grateful, but again, um, all of that old fear and anxiety um, settled in. And um, again, unfortunately, we were hit with the hyperemesis. Um, again, this time a little more severe. 
Um, I had to actually be on um, bed rest with home health care, um, IV fluids, um, a Zofran pump, which gives pregnancy so that I could just basically hold down basic water and food. Um, so once again, even though we'd had two pregnancies and we'd had some difficult um, time with those, we're been into our third and still felt like, gosh, this is just continuing to get harder. Um, but fast forward to the end of that pregnancy, um, we did have to um, deliver our girl a little bit early, but she was healthy and um, did not have to spend any time in the NICU, thankfully. Um, and so that's kind of, fast forward, they're now 10 and six, um, very happy, healthy kids, beautiful, we love them, we feel very blessed. Um, but looking back on the whole season of growing our family, um, none of our pregnancies went the way that we had anticipated, the way we had envisioned, the way we saw any of our friends' pregnancies. Um, we kind of felt like we were alone on this little island of, you know, just things going wrong. And, and um, you know, so now we're at a place where looking back, we hope that maybe there's some good that we can do by sharing our story. Um, maybe, um, you know, speaking hope to others who are going through something similar. Um, so, and that's what, you know, uh, motivated us to be here today. And so I hope we can do that. Thank you. Um, today we are joined uh, by an incredible panel of experts, each of whom play an important role in caring for moms and their babies through high-risk pregnancies. Uh, please join me first in welcoming Dr. Shalini Gola, who is an OBGYN in North Florida Women's Care and TMH. Dr. Gola enjoys caring for women through every stage of life, including helping families navigate infertility and high-risk pregnancies. We're also joined today by Dr. Bill Doback, maternal fetal medicine specialist at TMH. Dr. Doback cares for women with high-risk pregnancies and those who require special monitoring, special attention, and support. We have been in his office a few times um, in, our, in our lives. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Joanne Fato, or excuse me, not doctor, Nurse Joanne Fato, RN, Assistant Nurse Manager in TMH's High Risk Delivery, Labor and Delivery Unit. Joanne oversees the Labor and Delivery Operation Rooms and Post Anesthesia Care Unit, working closely with moms who have cesarean sections and those with complicated births. Joanne is also an integral part of TMH's bereavement program and supports parents going through infant loss. Finally, please join me in welcoming neonatologist, Dr. Stephen Morse. Dr. Morse is the medical director of TMH's Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, or NICU. He is specially trained in caring for premature babies and infants who need extra attention at birth and beyond and supports families with children in the NICU. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, to, together, you know, our, today our goal is to start a conversation about high-risk pregnancies, answer your questions, and hopefully um, you'll feel more at ease as you think about growing your family um, and preparing to welcome a new little one um, that may already be on the way. Uh, many of you submitted questions ahead of time, which we'll be diving into momentarily. If you have additional questions as we go, please use the, the Q&A function on Zoom. There's a feature there. It's probably at the bottom of your screen um, to submit them. We'll be monitoring them as they come through and sharing them with our experts in real time. So without further ado, we'll get started. Um, Dr. Gola, let's start off with some of the basics. Uh, what exactly is considered a high-risk pregnancy and how do you know if you're high risk and what causes it? First, I wanna say hello to everybody. Nice to meet you, Sean Courtney. Um, so, uh, and thank you for inviting me for this very impor important conversation. And this is something I, you know, thought about a little bit. And hi a high-risk pregnancy, I consider as one in which raises a woman's or her baby's chance of having health problems um, that may require an intervention either by, you know, an OBGYN or a maternal and fetal medicine specialist or a neonatologist. And usually, uh, it requires special monitoring, like we talked about, and either by myself or by an OBGYN or an MFM specialist. That's what I consider as a high risk pregnancy. And usually, you know, we talk to patients about whether if they have a high risk status and there can be 
innumerable uh, factors that can contribute to being a high-risk pregnancy. Um, Dr. Gola, what would be those, you know, are certain people more likely to be high at risk or at high risk? And what are some of those factors that, that go into that? Sometimes, you know, a high-risk pregnancy can be a result of a medical condition that can be present prior to the pregnancy for a woman. And that can include things like high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, you know, heart disorders, poorly controlled asthma, um, repeated infections. So any of those can contribute to that. Also things I think about are, you know, lifestyle choices like smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, um, other drugs, drug use, um, things that sort of aren't really controlled or things like advanced maternal age, you know, as women age, that can be a factor in contributing to a high risk pregnancy. As we note, we do notice that after 35, women do tend to have those high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes as more prevalent in their health problems. So those are Thank just you. some of them. Um, one of the questions that was asked was, what about families who have experienced infertility? Mm -hmm. um, did they have a higher um, risk chance for, um, um, for high risk pregnancy? Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, so pregnancies that occur after treatments for infertility, especially assisted reproductive technologies, IVF, things like that, they we do see that they are higher risk because they do tend to develop more, you know, preeclampsia, growth restriction for babies, um, bleeding during their pregnancies, and preterm labor. So yes. Um, so a question, uh, Doctor Devac. Once a woman knows her pregnancy is high risk, where does she go from there? And then does she need to see a specialist or undergo special testing? Well, thank you again for hosting this conversation and letting me be a part of it. We certainly think there is value in a teamwork approach with healthcare. A lot of it is going to a collaboration between OBGYN, maternal fetal and neonatology and some other pediatric subspecialists might be invited into care. And oftentimes we'll see them early on in a pregnancy. Sometimes we'll see mom's preconception. There are certain things, like Dr. Gola said, some risk factors that if we can address or improve uh, diabetes control, uh, we certainly can improve outcomes prior to conception just by improvement in certain healthcare markers. And then early on in pregnancy, we can talk about genetic conditions. Some families are carriers for certain genetic disorders that might place them at higher risk. Family history of preeclampsia is another area in which we are talking to more and more moms and families about perhaps starting even a low dose aspirin where studies have shown some improvement in decreasing preeclampsia rates. In the second trimester, a lot of our focus is on decreasing the risk for prematurity. So oftentimes we'll follow cervical lengths. And then in the third trimester, a lot of it does become preeclampsia uh, monitoring as well as growth. We certainly know some fetuses might be at increased risk for growth restriction and the associated complications that come with that. So, for someone who's never heard of a maternal fetal specialist, which most people haven't until they have to go see one, how would you describe what your role is? Another great question. So a lot of our role is with collaboration with the OBGYNs in the community. Most cities will have maternal fetal as a consultative service where we're invited to participate in the care based on certain risk factors that moms or couples might have uh, going into the pregnancy or things that might develop in the pregnancy. A lot of the times we won't know until we get to the 18, 20, 22 week marker. And then we'll be invited to collaborate just to see what else can be done to help improve outcomes. Good. Um, so Dr. Gola, a question for you, and, and this is one of those that I think Courtney and I can relate to uh, greatly. Um, so pregnancy, pregnancy comes with lots of new feelings and symptoms. 
a lot of high-risk pregnancy you tend to be hyper aware of those symptoms and worried um, that they could be signaling something's wrong. Are there signs or symptoms that women with high-risk pregnancies need to be extra vigilant and monitoring? So, yes, uh, high-risk pregnancies can I, I can create a lot of anxiety and hyper awareness in patients, and I always tell my patients, you know. If you're worried about something, my job is to make sure that I ease your worry. That's my role in uh, your care. And some, of course, some symptoms are more concerning than others, yeah, particularly, you know, with preeclampsia, the severe onset headache that doesn't go away. Um, of course, headaches are very common in pregnancy and just throughout the pregnancy. So um, definitely those more third trimester headaches that, you know, you take your Tylenol, you're drinking your water, you're resting, and they're not going away. Those are, those are definitely concerning to us. Um, visual changes. Um, and of course, visual changes are also part of normal pregnancy. You do, you know, your lens changes during the pregnancy and you have some blurry vision and that's not uncommon, but there are some severe visual changes that can happen with preeclampsia and um, things like right upper quadrant pain and fevers and especially fainting uh, is also can be concerning in pregnancy. So I always tell people, if you're worried, I'm worried. And I wanna make sure that I use, you know, I convince myself and you that we're not worried together at this point. Right. So, yeah. That's good, that's good. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, the next question is for Joanna. Um, it says, what if I need emergency obstetrical care? Where can I go? And when is it appropriate to go? Sure, great question. Um, and thank you everyone for having me here today. Um, so I think the first thing that's important to think about um, is in the beginning of your pregnancy, do your research, look at the um, areas, hospitals that you live in, and you wanna see what their level of care is. Um, so I can speak to Tass Memorial Healthcare and what their level of care is. Um, we are the region's only um, high risk obstetrical unit. Um, we also have this region's um, only level three NICU. Um, so going into your pregnancy, um, some women don't um, exactly know that they're high, gonna be high risk. Um, we see a lot of patients on a daily basis that have had a completely normal pregnancy and then um, become high risk towards the end of their pregnancy or even at their delivery, um, meet complications or have obstetrical emergencies. And you wanna make sure you have located yourself and chosen a, a healthcare facility that can meet all of the needs that may um, happen. Um, and being high risk doesn't just stop with pregnancy. Um, it can go into the postpartum period as well. So kind of knowing um, what your options are, I think is, um, one of the best first steps um, when you first um, are pregnant and trying to decide about your healthcare. Um, once you are around 14 weeks along in your pregnancy, if you have any concerns, um, all the way up to 12 weeks postpartum, my recommendation would be to come to our, um, the TAS Memorial Healthcare um, triage area. Um, that area is staffed with specialized nurses um, to take care of any high-risk um, situations that may occur, as well as um, one of our OB providers that's there 24-7 um, that can lay hands on you, assess you um, to see whether um, you, know, you need admission to the hospital in an inpatient status, or we can treat your symptoms and send you back home to be with your family. So um, when is it appropriate to come to triage? Again, between 14 weeks all the way up into that 12 week postpartum period. And then if your um, experience is any symptoms such as Dr. Gola stated of preterm labor, um, that's something, some symptoms of that would be um, cramping, contractions, um, vaginal bleeding, vaginal leaking, a change in discharge. Um, back pain can sometimes be associated with preterm labor. Um, also any signs of preeclampsia, um, headache, visual changes, um, swelling, epigastric pain. Uh, if you're starting to experience any of that, that would be um, my first recommendation is to come to our triage and let, you, let us assess you. The other thing that's important to remember is um, fetal movement. Um, once you hit around 32 weeks in your pregnancy, 
you want to really be monitoring um, that fetal movement because it can become more regular at that point. And doing those kick counts is important. Um, we recommend that you do kick counts throughout the day to make sure your baby's moving appropriately. Um, and we want in a, um, a two hour period for your baby to move at least 10 times. And so if your baby is not meeting those requirements, we would want you to come into our um, high risk labor and delivery into our triage area so that we can assess you and make sure that everything is still normal with your pregnancy. So um, if someone comes in and they get an assessment and then it's determined that they need to be put on bed rest, um, what would you tell someone that does need to get put on bed rest and what would that look like for them? How do they move forward for the rest of the pregnancy? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, bed rest can look different um, depending on what's going on with the patient, right? So some patients can come in and we can see that they need to be put on bed rest, but they can do that and be managed on an outpatient basis. Um, their provider will work with them and make the decisions along with our maternal fetal medicine specialist on what the best route of that is. If that's the case, um, the patient would be at home, um, you know, monitoring their symptoms themselves, and then um, coming into their OB office, their internal fetal medicine office, and also our triage area for um, any testing or symptom management. Some of our patients um, need to be monitored even more closely than that. So we have a dedicated unit um, in the TMH labor and delivery called the antenatal care unit. It is a 12 bed unit. That unit specializes in those patients that need to be on bed rest. Um, and they can receive on this unit um, the monitoring that they need. They can be seen by their OB provider and the maternal fetal medicine specialist, as well as if they need any other specialties um, to come in and evaluate them, such as cardiac, respiratory, any other specialist that they may need to consult. Um, that's one location that they can be at and get all of the consults they need. Now, if that patient's um, symptoms were to intensify and they become un unstable, they would then be transferred to our high-risk labor and delivery unit. That is an 18-bed unit that we consider to be critical care. Um, so they would be sent down to that unit where they would be cared for by our um, staff, which is specially trained to take care of those moms who may have obstetrical complications or even obstetrical emer emergencies. Yeah, um, it says, if I've had a previous high risk pregnancy, and I'm sorry, this is for Dr. Novak. Um, well, I definitely have another. And knowing that answer, should I prepare for my second pregnancy any differently? So, having had a prior high risk pregnancy does mean future pregnancies will be monitored more closely. Thankfully, uh, much of the time, outcomes can improve. However, the problem is that's hard to know the start of the pregnancy. And unfortunately, that may not always be the case. But once you have been termed a high-risk pregnancy, the majority of the time, if the risk factors are unchanged, then the next pregnancy will be considered high-risk as well. And you'll be followed a little more carefully. But Thankfully, we know that outcomes can definitely improve in subsequent pregnancies, and it doesn't always mean you'll have the same outcome as before. Gotcha. Okay. Here's another question. Uh, Dr. Doback, uh, if, um, excuse me, Dr. Gola, having had three, we've been through three high-risk pregnancies um, and losing one of our children. So we know personally this experience can come with a lot of um, stress, anxiety, and fear. Uh, what's your advice for parents that, that are navigating through circumstances like that? That's a tough question. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, it's unfortunately never an easy area to navigate. And right. of course, no two families deal with the loss the same way. But I think, I think my goal always is to try to let my patients know that I'm there for them during that time. And I try to, uh, and I also find that, you know, mental health counseling is a very important portion of the healing process. And so I try to partner with my mental health colleagues and also maternal and fetal medicine and involve everybody to make sure that you know that there's resources out in the community um, that can be helpful in the healing process. So 
I think I think the biggest thing I would say is to reach out and you know don't shut yourself in during that time because that can be an easy thing to do. So absolutely. Um, so for Dr. Dr. Dobak, um, once I know my pregnancy is high risk, again, not me personally, but perhaps my wife should read this one. Um, how can I best take care of myself and my baby during a pregnancy? What's the I think a lot of it does involve the, the follow-up, and there are so many different uh, scenarios in which a pregnancy becomes high risk. A lot of it might involve different medications. Sometimes we do involve just frequent follow-up to better assess how the fetus or fetuses are doing. Just like Dr. Gola said, mental health is an incredibly an important part of this. There's an incredible amount of grieving that goes through with any pregnancy complication, especially losses. And so we want to make sure we always utilize our mental health colleagues appropriately when needed. And they're incredibly invaluable in this. And always let your providers know what you're experiencing. I think that's probably the most important thing. We can certainly have a plan on how to follow up, but a lot of it depends on what you're experiencing. Like Joanna said, if you're not feeling the baby move, our anxiety levels definitely skyrocket and let someone know or come into our triage area to get evaluated. But a lot of it does depend on what were the risk factors that made the pregnancy high risk. And then with any pregnancy, it can be high risk for reasons other than what prior pregnancies had been. And so a lot of it is just never hesitating and letting your providers know what you're experiencing, never hesitating asking any questions and letting us know what you're experiencing and let, and reaching out for help when, when needed. Um, this one's probably more appropriate for me to ask as a partner. <laughs> what role does the partner play? What's your advice for taking care of yourself while also supporting a partner through their high-risk pregnancy? What, Dr. Dobak, what would you say to that? That's a tough question because, right, we, I think we sometimes forget that the significant other, the husband, uh, might also be experiencing a loss and grief. And a lot of it's support. A lot of this does um, require reaching out to family members. And if family's not close, letting some many folks at TMH know where you're needing some help. We certainly have a great social workers that can try and help with helping you make ends meet or finding what you need during those complicated pregnancies. But a lot of it right, is, is to support each other because the emotional stress, the feelings of guilt that any couple has when things don't go the, as planned, sure that everyone knows how you're feeling and how we can better help you. Yeah, I think we can, you know, from our experiences, I know that um, for whatever this is worth for folks, is we, we asked, you know, both you and and Dr. Golden kind of said the same thing. We asked a ton of questions and we came in all the time. If we were nervous about something, if anything was going on, we always came in, we called, we checked. Um, and I know that helped us a lot, especially with the our, our two, our last two was um, being, you know, really stressed out and fearful during that process is asking a question, having a response, having, you know, that in our case, Dr. McAlpin say, everything's good, you're okay, you can go home, it's good. I mean, that was really helpful for us. And we always felt like there was always, someone there to answer a question and, and never that we were bothering anybody. So we always appreciated that very much at, at TMH when we were there. Um, let's see, Joanna. Yeah. <clears throat> so this question is for Joanna. Um, many moms have a plan and a vision for their childbirth experience and um, or what their experience will be like. Um, but having a high risk pregnancy can throw that plan obviously for a loop. Does a high risk pregnancy mean that someone will have to change their birth plan or that they'll need a C-section? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so first off, birth plans. I think it's really important to come into birth with a plan and to have ideas of um, how you would ideally see your birth go. But I um, always recommend to patients, when you're thinking about making a birth plan, think of all avenues. Um, because birth um, and labor is um, there's a lot of unknowns with that. And so preparing yourself for those unknowns is um, usually a good thing. So don't just think only vaginal delivery or only unmedicated delivery. Think, okay, well, what if I do have to have a C-section? What are some of the wants um, and wishes that I may want in those situations? So when you come in um, to our unit and you um, have your birth plan, 
I would say to definitely communicate your wants, your needs, your wishes with the nursing staff, as well as your providers that are going to be taking care of you and delivering your baby. Um, I can speak from um, a nurse's standpoint. We always want um, our patients to have fantastic experience. Um, birth and the delivery of their baby is um, an important um, thing in, in a person's life. And making that experience the best it can be is always our goal. Um, so how can your birth plan change? So if there are things, um, complications happen, um, you're now deemed to be high risk, we may need to just monitor you more closely during your labor, which is something that we're all trained um, to do. Um, does that necessarily mean you have to have a cesarean? No, it does not. Um, and that is a decision that um, your OB, your maternal fetal medicine specialist, and yourself will all decide on the best means for the delivery of your baby. Um, for vaginal deliveries, it may mean we just need to monitor you closer or have our NICU team avail available at your delivery. Um, sometimes when the need for delivery the, the speed of delivery is something that's important, then we may have to progress to a um, cesarean delivery. Um, if that is the case, we have um, three OR suites um, that can take care of you surgically if that's something that um, is deemed to be required. We also have a fantastic team of anesthesia providers that are that specialize in our area and they're with us 24 seven. So that's really, really great. Um, and we can also do things in our OR setting um, to make it as um, meaningful and as help you to bond with that baby um, during your procedure. Um, we are the region's only um, baby friendly hospital, which we're really excited about. And that kind of just points to um, that we have a big push on a mother having a choice. Um, a mother, if she just decides to breastfeed, um, we are specially trained to help with exclusive breastfeeding. Um, immediate skin to skin is something um, that we um, do with all of our moms and babies, if that's something that the mother wishes, because we found that that's um, evidence-based practice, best evidence-based practice. So we can still do those things in the OR um, and in our PACU area. And the baby stays with the mom and dad throughout the procedure and into the PACU um, where you recover um, for about an hour before you're transferred up onto our family care unit where those things such as skin to skin and breastfeeding are continued. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so Dr. Morse, um, one fear that often comes with high-risk pregnancies is that the baby will arrive too early. Uh, how early is too early? And is that something families should prepare for and how they do that? That's a, that's a great question. Um, first, again, thank you, like all the other panelists, for having me here today. I also want to thank you for sharing your story. That's not, diff that's not easy to do, but I think it helps other parents know that they're not alone in their struggles. I see that a lot with parents I deal with, so thank you for doing that. As far as the question for too early, you know, um, when I look at this, I'm looking at babies development of their organ systems and when can they function without our assistance. Ideally, you want your pregnancy to reach term, which is considered around 39 to 40 weeks. Now, there's a range on that. You can be as early as 37 weeks and as late as about 41 to 42 weeks, and that is all considered term, not too early. Below that, you know, when you get to 36 weeks or less, that's when you consider it to be a premature delivery and some of the risks start to go up at that point. Um, now, there's a wide range on that. You know, if, if your baby's born a month early, let's say 34 to 36 weeks, um, you know, they, they may look okay. And on, from the outside, everything looks all right, but they're still premature on the inside and may need some help from the NICU. And, you know, that goes all the way down to the limits of survival, which is about four months premature. So that, that's the range of what would be considered too early. Um, how you prepare for that, you know, the, the good news is 90% of pregnancies don't need intervention from the neonatal or recession te resuscitation team or the NICU. So first thing is try not to worry too much. Um, but about 10% of pregnancies do need some help either in the delivery room or that extends into needing some NICU care. So what I recommend to parents is don't obsess too much on the what ifs and what can go wrong because 90% go well. 
but think of a NICU as your insurance policy. So I would talk with your obstetricians about where you're gonna deliver. Does that hospital have a NICU? Um, what is that NICU's level of care? And what services can they provide? Get the information, know that there's a NICU available. And that probably is what you need to know. Um, again, it's like insurance. You wanna have it, you want it to be good quality, but you hope to never have to use it. Um, my last advice on preparing has to do with what you talked to Joanna about with birth plans. And um, you know, by the time I see parents, birth plans have gone off the rails, right? I mean, you've gone through all these things, didn't go with what you wanted. And now you're dealing with me and my NICU and it is certainly not following what your birth plan has written down. Doing a birth plan is a good idea because it gives parents a chance to discuss with each other what their expectations are for during pregnancy, during delivery, and then the care of the baby afterwards. So it opens up questions that you can address together. But my most important thing on that is to be flexible in your birth plan uh, because certainly things are gonna change. And we all know babies have their own set of rules and they're gonna do what they want no matter what you write down. Um, so I would be flexible. You know, my, my goal with a birth plan is one line that you have a healthy baby that goes home as soon as possible. How we get there is a lot of different ways. So that's how I would prepare during your pregnancy for navigating what could go wrong. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, let's see. So follow up, Dr. Morse. Uh, what are the risks associated with babies being born too early? What could you say to that? So, you know, as you can imagine, it all is very individualized to that particular baby, and there's a wide range of possibilities for certain risks. But to try and answer your question a little more specifically, you know, if you divide it up on how early a baby is, if a baby is, let's say, a month early, that 34 to 36 week range, we consider that a late preterm pregnancy. Again, those babies can look totally healthy and term on the outside, but some of their systems are still developing. So they will have some short term problems and risks, low blood sugars, low body temperatures, some mild breathing difficulties uh, that may need some care in the NICU, but they're short-term problems that can be dealt with in the hospital in a NICU. And long-term, those babies do very well. Yeah. So, you know, that's the first month. If you get two months early, again, long-term, those babies generally do very well, but you're gonna have a, a longer NICU stay and may need some higher specialized care. When you get to three or four months, uh, those are more difficult. Those are higher risk babies that do have risk for some developmental problems later on. Now, I will say that babies are incredibly tough, much tougher than us adults. Um, their brains are highly adaptable to work around any potential injuries that they might have. So we're always more hopeful with babies, but it does get to be much more individualized when you're three or four months premature. So what we do is we try to provide consultation to parents directly. So if you're admitted with a high risk preterm delivery, we try to come see you shortly after your admission to review your case. We talk with Dr. Gola, Dr. Doback, hear about what's going on with the mother and the baby. And then we sit down and we spend as much time as parents need to review. Here's what to expect for a delivery right now. Here's what to expect immediately in the short term and what could happen long term. And that way everybody's on the same page because because it is hard to know the it's not the same case for every parent because every baby's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Morris, I'm going to tie in a little bit of my history and, and let you know how grateful I am for people like you. Um, I was a 26 week baby myself, preemie, um, spent three months in the NICU, went home, had, had some issues, but Clearly, I think I turned out. She made it. I made it. Um, so part of my history was always hearing my mother tell the story of, you know, my delivery and my stay in the NICU. And um, ironically, Dr. Hume, uh, yeah. who I think you work with, Dr. Novak, was one of my doctors when I was born in 1979. And he was doing his clinical rotations. And so we kind of made a reconnection at TMH. Um, you know, sadly, it was during our first loss that yeah. I met him. But we had this whole history together, which was very interesting. Um, but, you know, I always, I grew up hearing the story of my birth and, and how hard it was for my parents for me to be in the NICU for so long and have so many medical issues. Um, moving forward, obviously we had our loss, but then with our second child, Noah, he went into the NICU. Um, and it's, it's not that I remember being in the NICU, but it just sort of brought all these 
just these things to my mind of, you know, um, just how hard it was to um, not be able to hold your baby. I didn't even hold our mm -hmm. son until he was three days old. Um, part of that is because I was so sick as well. Um, but just even just that separation of not being able to be side by side with your baby. Um, I think the medical part of knowing that they are sick and struggling is one thing. There's also the emotional component of I can't have my baby with me, um, which is a whole other set of issues. Um, so to go to our next question, um, it can be a very emotional experience for families to be separated from their babies after birth. Um, what is your advice for those families um, during that time, whether they are still in the hospital or whether the families have to go home yeah. and leave their babies? Um, what is your advice for them? How do you support them and help them navigate that process? Sure, that's a great question. And um, yeah, like Dr. Hume, I, I've been doing this about 20 years and I'm starting to take care of babies of mothers who were babies of <laughs> yeah. Start to wonder how long I should be doing this, but uh, but it is nice to see that. So I appreciate the story. Um, yeah, you know, when, when your baby goes to the NICU and is separated from you, it, it is one of the most traumatic experiences for parents. It, it, you lose all control, both mothers and particularly fathers have this problem. Um, you know, you're thinking, I'm going to be there for my child, I'm going to protect them. And now they're completely away from you. And, and, you know, every parent would switch places with that baby if they could, but they can't and they feel helpless. Um, and we, we appreciate that. Um, we're humbled to be the ones to care for your babies when they're in that situation because uh, you're entrusting your child's life to us, somebody that you probably have not met before. So my goal and advice to parents is, you know, connect with those providers as quickly as possible. Um, but take a deep breath because you're going to hear more information than you could possibly absorb at one time and, and not remember most of it. So don't worry too much because you will hear us repeat that information over and over again and ask a lot of questions. Um, like you mentioned earlier that you ask questions. That's the best thing parents can do. And ask the same question 10 times if you need to till you remember or understand what it is. Don't, you know, parents tend to say, oh, OK, I get it. And they don't really, and, and then they're worried about what's really happening. All they know is there's something they don't understand, so it's probably bad. So keep asking the questions till you get the explanation you need. Um, take it a day at a time, right? The, the NICU, you know, the first question is always, when can my baby go home? And it's the one question we can't answer right away because we just don't have a lot of information. So, you know, pace yourself, take it a day at a time ask a lot of questions. Um, I would I would keep a journal. You know, I used to tell people, get your paper journal. I guess now it's on phones or tablets, but however you keep a journal, do that daily um, and write down everything that you hear. You know, if you meet a new provider, a new respiratory therapist, write their names down, ask that person, you know, what they're doing with your baby and you'll get more comfortable with the care that your baby's receiving. And you can refer back to your notes of what we said yesterday was the plan and, and now what is the plan today? Because it, it will change on a daily basis and it can be hard to keep up. So I would definitely keep some kind of journal for yourself. And it's actually, when I talk to parents later, a nice thing to have later on once your baby's home. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things is uh, I refer to it affectionately as Dr. Google. Uh, the internet is a uh, could, can be a useful place, but it can be a dangerous place also. And, and uh, I tell parents to avoid it, but I use it. You're going to use it. So what I tell people is when you've looked up some of the things we've talked about, the internet is going to show you the scariest version of that possible usually. Uh, come back to us. And I even sit down with parents and look at that website or whatever they've found to try to help them understand, because it's usually not the same situation that they're going through exactly. Some of it can be the same. And there are some useful websites out there. I don't think it's all a bad thing, but it, it can tend to lead you down a, a scary path that you shouldn't go alone, you know, get our help so we can explain things to you. Um, I'd say lastly, take breaks. You know, it, it's a, a long roller coaster for parents. Um, and, you know, you're obviously first inclination is to be there as much as you can. And we encourage that. We want you to be in there. But it's also good for you and important to take breaks for yourself, your other children with each other. Because, um, again, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So you, you want to pace yourself. Um, 
So that's probably the advice I, I would start out with. Um, you know, I, I can, I don't know if you want to talk about sort of other things you, you mentioned about um, being separated from your baby. Um, there's some things we do in the hospital on that. So I don't know if, if you had other questions or want me to go into some of that now. Or... Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. So, um, you know, we've, one thing at TMH we do is we're an open family-centered care NICU. So that means we're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week for you to visit as parents. Obviously, COVID changed a lot of the visitation policies and has made things more restrictive, but we are we still have parents can come in 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, and we have one parent visit at a time, but under certain circumstances, parents can be there together. And we will eventually, once we get through this, open that back up to both parents being at the bedside together um, at any time that they want to. Um, you can also call 24 hours a day to check on your baby. So I tell moms or dads, if you wake up at three o'clock in the morning and have a bad feeling, why'd I wake up? Is something wrong with my baby? Don't lay there and worry. Call the NICU. You know, the people on call aren't sleeping. They're up. They're happy to take your phone call. They can reassure you that your baby's doing okay, and you can go back to sleep. So don't be afraid to use the phone. Call us. Visit whenever you want, but TMH has that available. We as a medical team will talk to every family every day and provide you an update at least once a day, if not more. So once we make our medical rounds, look at all the information that are coming up with a plan, I'll come out to the room, talk with you, or if you're not here, I'll call you on the phone and we'll provide you sort of what the plan for that day is gonna be, answer any questions you have. Um, invariably, there'll be questions you have that you forget to ask when we call, but write them down or call back and we're happy to talk to you again. But we're available as providers to answer your questions 24 hours a day also, as well as the nursing staff can do that. Um, we have services available in the NICU that, that do help with your separation. There's things as simple as something called a scent heart, which is basically a piece of cloth that we give to parents that you bring home and you put it on your skin. It, it picks up your, your scent, so to speak, um, and you bring that back and we place that in the baby's isolate or in their crib. So that way, some of the bonding that you're losing by being separated can still continue. Um, the baby can get your smell when they're feeding, kind of connect that smell with some comforting things like feedings. Uh, so we do that, you know, simple procedure, but it provides some comfort to the baby and some reassurance to you as parents that you're connecting with your baby, even when you're not able to be there. When you are there, uh, Joanna mentioned skin to skin care after delivery. We continue that in the NICU. We are actually involved in a statewide program right now to improve and make that a better experience for parents. You mentioned you didn't get to hold your baby for three days. Um, that, that's tough, all right? Uh, and you watch your baby, you can't hold them. Um, there are some medical conditions we do have to wait, but most of the time, even babies are very small, one pound, two pound babies on a ventilator. If they're stable, they can be held by the parents. And our team is trained on how to help you to do that, both moms and dads. So we put the baby's skin to skin on the chest. It allows the baby to hear your heartbeat. For moms, it's the heartbeat they've been hearing for months. Um, it's familiar to them. It actually stabilizes their vital signs. Um, they get your breathing pattern. It helps to stabilize their breathing pattern. And it definitely helps with your bonding experience. And for moms who are pumping, providing breast milk, it helps for their milk let down to help their milk supply also. So we have a skin to skin program in the NICU. Gotcha. We have a dedicated lactation person just for the NICU, NICU to help you for breast pump and breastfeeding. Um, premature babies can breastfeed. It, it can happen. Um, some people don't think so when they first hear about it, but we have a team that works with you directly to be able to do that. And then we have a fairly unique program here in the NICU at TMH of a music therapy, and they work with our babies. They work with parents to provide um, a music uh, which does help both parents and to uh, help babies also. So that's some of the things we do here at TMH. Gotcha. Thank you very much. I'm going to do the last question. Um, Dr. Bella, um, let's talk just real quick about loss. Um, it can be really scary for our families like ours who've experienced the loss of a baby uh, to get pregnant again. Um, are the chances higher that you lose another child? And what's your advice to those going through that experience? Thank you, and I'm and I'm really sorry for your loss. Um, that is a very difficult situation to go through, and you know, 
course, the anxiety and the hyper awareness and the fear, all of that comes back. Um, and it can be scary to get pregnant again, just the fact of, you know, some, and I think I always tell people after a loss that it's important to connect with your partner, partner, figure out what your goals are, you know, maybe something you may not, you know, some people may decide not to have children after such an experience and, and some people are, you know, more motivated to try again. And so it definitely depends on the couple. And so I definitely tell the patients to talk to their partners and because they're your biggest support system during this whole thing, your family and your partners. So, uh, but once a woman does have a loss, depending on what trimester it happens in, they can be at a, a higher risk of a loss in the future. Um, you know, the first, usually if your loss is in the first trimester, uh, those are, you know, unfortunately fairly common. Um, almost one in four pregnancies ends up in a miscarriage during the first trimester. And that even that can be a very difficult situation for, you know, uh, women and their partners to get through. Um, and as you go farther along, it's not as common to have a loss, but, you know, things like breaking water or having your cervix uh, not being able to hold the pregnancy, those are things that can happen. And sometimes in the next pregnancy, we can plan for those things um, in doing things like a cervical cerclage or something like that. Uh, right. But there are some things that we unfortunately can't prepare for. And, um, but yes, uh, and to answer your question, you are, you know, marked as a high risk pregnancy when you do become pregnant again. And there's a slightly higher chance of um, having a second loss later on. But again, like Dr. Dobak said earlier, every pregnancy is different, both for the mother and the baby. And mm -hmm. so it, it, it just depends on what other risk factors are going on, whether, you know, it's previous medical conditions that caused it, you know, those kinds of things that can be modified. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Long. Um, we have a question from um, a person who's participating today. And this really is to, to anyone who wants to answer this. Do you think that the stress from the pandemic has led to more high-risk pregnancies connected to high blood pressure? That was my experience or this person's experience. I um, was curious to hear whether there is a scientific basis for that or not, or is this perhaps just anecdotal in this person's case? Any thoughts from anyone there? So interestingly, that has been noted in some of the literature, it hasn't been consistent, but they, many medical centers have reported an increased rate of fetal demise with the pandemic. And we're trying to better understand why that is. Other literature hasn't been quite as consistent in finding that. And so I think we're still kind of looking at the data, see how true it is, but early on, many of our maternal fetal colleagues were sounding the alarm that they were starting to see a higher fetal demise rate with the pandemic. It actually has been true in some of the literature. Thank you, Dr. Um, and, and I'll say oh, yes. real quick, um, you know, I feel like one of the other things that uh, we've talked about is the preeclampsia has also been noted to high blood pressure with COVID has also been an association as well. So I think it does increase some elevated blood pressure issues towards later parts of pregnancy and things like that. So thank you, Dr. Bill. Um, so we have a last question um, from a person attending today. Can you please discuss the risk with an overall healthy woman approaching her forties, but is interested in getting pregnant? Should she expect to have complications? Dr. Gold? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? For sure, yeah. yeah. Can you please discuss the risks with an overall healthy woman approaching her 40s but is interested in getting pregnant? Should she expect to have complications? I think 
you know, as we've talked about, any pregnancy can become a high risk pregnancy at any point during the pregnancy. Uh, you know, you can have a very young woman who, you know, ends up in a postpartum hemorrhage needing to have a C-section. So uh, pregnancy is a very unpredictable time. I would say there are some factors, you know, if you're over 35, it does slightly increase your risk of blood pressure and diabetes and growth restriction for the baby preterm labor. But overall healthy people, I would say I, I don't see any reason to be ex extremely worried during the pregnancy. And of course, we follow those pregnancies a little bit closer. And like Dr. Doback talked about, one of the things that we do promote right now is a baby aspirin to help prevent uh, preeclampsia that's been shown to be very helpful. So there's, I, I would say, you know, they can expect mostly a normal pregnancy. Um, looks like we're getting close to the end here. So um, is there anything that anyone else would like to add in addition, maybe anything we didn't touch on today or anything that you pop in your head that you um, I could add to um, in our discussion? So I, I, I would just have one thing. It, it's Dr. Morse. Um, I, I, we take care of babies that are born here at TMH, but we also serve as a regional transfer center. So I get a lot of babies coming from other hospitals. And, and it is um, difficult, extremely difficult on those families being separated from their babies. And, and a lot of them say, well, I had no idea that my baby would have to be transferred out. I thought they could do everything here. Um, and so I, I would sort of put out there to ask your, your provider, your OB provider about what services are available at the hospital you're gonna be delivering at. You know, again, I, I mentioned it before, but having a NICU in your hospital is an incredibly good insurance policy. It, it means, although your baby may have to stay and you didn't expect it, your baby will be close to you. You will be able to see your baby right away. We'll be able to talk with you directly. Uh, it, it helps to ease the burden some. So just, just a little, um, advice to parents to, to ask those questions up front. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think that um, is bringing us to the end of our time today. Um, I want to thank you all so much for your time and insight and for everybody attending. Thank you for everybody who's tuned in for the discussion. We'll be sending out an email to everyone who registered with a recording of today's talk and links to some of the resources our experts mentioned today. Uh, we really hope you join us for the remainder of our baby and family virtual speaker series. We have webinars every day next week uh, covering topics from unmedicated childbirth to healthy child development. Uh, to see our, the full lineup and register, uh, you can visit tmh.org slash fair. We thank you again very much and everyone have a great weekend. Thank you. <laughs>